Um, I'm very uh, privileged to be able to stand up here in front of you guys this morning and just share with you uh, one lesson that I feel like God has really put on my heart and, and taught me over the past four years. One day three years ago, it was the summer after my freshman year at Biola, I was back home in Minnesota for the summer, and uh, I went over to one of my friend's houses to watch a movie. Uh, so we're trying to pick what movie to watch and didn't really have a preference, so uh, one of my friends said he had just seen this good movie, he wanted us to watch it. Uh, it was called The Condemned. So didn't know anything about it. I was like, okay, sure, let's go ahead and watch it. Uh, let me summarize, summarize the plot for you a little bit. The movie is based around this television producer who decides that he wants to come up with this new reality TV show. And he wants this show to gain as many viewers as the Super Bowl. So he's going for huge records here. In order to do this, he decides that he needs to give the people what they really want to see. Raw, uncensored violence. So this is his idea for this reality show. He goes to third world prisons all over the world and collects 10 of the most brutal, vicious criminals that he can find. And he brings them and he puts them all on an island together. And this is the game. It's pretty simple. Last person living after 30 hours wins. Now he hid several weapons around the island and also hundreds of cameras so that every second of the brutal massacre that was to follow would be recorded and broadcast live over the internet where anyone could watch it for $50. The brutal murder and rape that followed uh, was astounding and the people loved it. People were, were flocking to their computers and it did. It attracted as many viewers as the Super Bowl does. It's quite astounding. While it was being filmed, some of the people on the film crew were uh, beginning to get uneasy because of the level of violence. They, they began to be uncomfortable with it, wondering, should we really be, be showing this kind of thing uh, so raw and uncensored, uncensored to so many people? But the producer loved it, and people all over the world were running to their computers to watch this. This movie was really giving a sort of commentary about our world and about the, the moral state of the people who inhabited it. However, as it did this, it was trapping the viewers of the movie that I was watching into the same spot that it was critiquing in the film. So all these people who were online watching this reality TV show were really no different than anyone who is sitting watching this movie. As I sat and watched the movie, I became deeply convicted. I started wondering, what, what are we doing watching this kind of, of needless violence? What, is, what good is this doing? And the thing that really struck me was one question that I just want to talk about a little bit today. And that's this. Why, why as Christians were we doing the same things that, that the world is doing? I, w I was sitting with, it with a group of Christian friends watching this movie. Why, why as Christians are we doing the same thing that the rest of the world is doing? What makes us different? What makes us stand out? And I, w I was so, so hit by this that that I, I just asked my friends, like, what, what are we doing? You know, as, as Christians, how, how is it that we can fill our minds with this kind of stuff? Christians are, are called throughout Scripture to, to be set apart. They're called to be different. Uh, the Bible talks about this as being holy or sacred. I want to read a couple of verses from Leviticus. Uh, which, is, which is all about being holy. God's giving all these laws for, for his people to know how to be holy. And, and this is what it says. Levit Leviticus 11, 44 through 45. For I am the Lord your God. Consecrate yourselves therefore and be holy, for I am holy. You shall not defile yourselves with any swarming thing that crawls on the ground. For I am the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt to be your God. You shall therefore be holy, for I am holy. 
Leviticus 19, 1 through 4. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to all the congregation of the people of Israel and say to them, You shall be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. Every one of you shall revere his mother and his father, and you shall keep my Sabbaths. I am the Lord your God. Do not turn to idols or make for yourselves any gods cast of metal. I am the Lord your God. Leviticus 20, 7 through 8. Consecrate yourselves therefore and be holy, for I am the Lord your God. Keep my statutes and do them, for I am the Lord who sanctifies you. Uh, and I like this one especially, Leviticus 20, 26. You shall be holy to me, for I am the Lord your God, and have separated you from the peoples. You shall be mine. Uh, Deuteronomy also uh, has this language also. In Deuteronomy 7, 6, it says, For you are a holy people to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for his treasured possession out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. Peter also picks up this language in his first letter. And in, in chapter 2, verse 9 of 1 Peter, he says, But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, for God's own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Now there, there's two questions that I, I just want to address real quickly. One's a really theoretical question and one's really practical. Uh, in theory, what, is it, what does it mean to be a holy people? I think that's, that's a, a, pretty easy answer to quest, a, a pretty easy question to answer in theory. Uh, and this is, this is what I would say. Uh, we see that to be a holy people is to be set apart for God, consecrated to God. It's to be different from that which is ordinary. It's to be separate from the usual, unusual in some sort of way. The law was given to Israel to make them a holy nation in that it would separate them from the nations around, it would distinguish them, and it would set them apart for the Lord. This is one of the ways that they were a holy nation. In Peter's letter, he continues uh, just after the verse that I read previously and says, Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh, which wage war against your soul. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. So, so being a holy people means that when people look at us, they see that our actions are different. They see there's something different about us from the world. And as I was watching that movie with my friends, I was struck by how similar we were to the world. So in theory, to, to be a holy people is to be set apart and, and different and distinguishable from the world around us. But there's also a very practical question that needs to be answered. And, and this, this is the part that I think we miss. I think we know in theory what that means, but I think we miss uh, practically what that means. So I've, I have a list of, of some areas uh, that practically speaking, when we, when we really apply this, we have an opportunity to, to be a holy people or to not be a holy people depending on how we, we treat these different areas. Movies. Uh, what kind of movies are we watching? Are they full of graphic violence like the movie that I was watching with my friends? Are they full of explicit language, sexual content? What, what are the movies that we're watching filled with? Are we, are we distinguished from the people around us based on the movies that we watch, or are we watching the same types of things as everyone else? How about our music? What are, are the lyrics edifying? Are they demeaning? What, what kind of things are they describing? How are they, uh, what, what image of, of women are they painting for us? Are they full of profanity? What, what kind of music are we listening to? How about the parties that we go to? What are, what are we doing at those parties? What are we drinking at those parties? What are we not drinking? Are we being faithful and, and honest to Biola with the contract that we signed? How about our computer? What are, what are we using our computers for? What are we looking at uh, late at night on our computers? What are we not looking at? What, what kind of emails are we sending each other? Money. How are we using our money? Are we using it wisely? Are we being foolish with it? Are we being generous? Do 
poor college students need to be generous with their money? How is it that we're using our money? And lastly, our time. What are we doing with our time? Are we spending too much time watching TV and movies and surfing the web and playing video games? Are we spending too much time on ourselves and, and not enough time on others? How is it that we're using our time? These are all areas that we have an opportunity to be different from the world around us. And these are, oppor these are areas that we, we should be, as Christians, different from the world around us. And if the movies that we're watching and the music that we're listening to, the parties that we're attending, the way we're using our computer, the way we're using our money and our time, if those aren't different from the world around us, if we can't look outside of Biola, outside of our Christian community, and notice a difference in the way that we're using those things, that we're acting in those different areas, then are we being a holy people? Are we following through on, on God's commandment to be holy? I would say probably not. Now, uh, real quick as I finish up, I, I know that sometimes, oftentimes, I don't feel holy. And I, I look at the ways that I'm living these, these different areas and I don't notice a drastic difference or, or any difference at all sometimes between the way that I'm acting and the way that my non-Christian friends are acting. And uh, that's, that's troubling to me. And, and you might be in the same position. I imagine many of you are, uh, from time to time at least. And I just want to, to leave you with this. You might feel that you are, are too dirty or too broken or just too ordinary to be holy. Maybe you feel that you don't have what it takes to, to be holy. God says, be holy as I am holy. How can we ever live up to that? And uh, the truth is that, that we can't. In, a, in our own power, we, we can't live the holy life that God calls us to. But the good news is, friends, that we are covered by the blood of Jesus. And if you have, have trusted in him as your Lord and Savior, and if you're following him and walking faithfully with him, you are, you are covered and your sins have been, been paid for. You have been purified. You have been made holy. That is already true of you if you are a follower of Jesus. And your actions might not line up with that all the time, but through the power of the Holy Spirit, you have an opportunity to begin living as a holy people. We as, as a community, through the power of the Holy Spirit, have the opportunity to live as a holy people. We have the opportunity to live different from the world around us. And uh, this is one of, one of the things that God has really been teaching me over the past several years since I've been at Biola especially. And uh, it's, it's been one of the, the biggest lessons that I've learned, certainly. And uh, I would really just exhort you guys uh, to go as you leave Biola or as you leave this place, as you move on to the next stage in life, or as you continue in the stage that you're, that you're in now, to seek to be a holy people. Seek to, to look at these areas, examine these areas of your life, and, and ask yourself, really, are you being holy? Are you different from the world around you? And uh, through the power of the Holy Spirit, that is something uh, that we can accomplish. So uh, I just want to leave you guys with that uh, and encourage you to go and to be the holy people that you are. Thanks, Pastor Dan. <sighs> well, it was my freshman year, and I was, I was about to go on a mission trip that ended up not working out. And I remember I was so excited about raising money and the opportunity to go and serve God somewhere else. And I was walking from Emerson to the cafeteria, because at the time I lived in Emerson, and I chose Emerson because it was the closest dorm to the cafeteria. And, um, and I remember as a freshman just walking along thinking, man, if I had a chance to speak in chapel one day, 
things I would tell Biola. I would tell them to get off their Xboxes and computers and sell them and use that money for the kingdom of God because they don't know what they're doing. And uh, so here I am. <laughs> and I'm not going to speak about that. So it's interesting what time does to you. You know, you kill a couple possums. You go to some anger management classes, you realize you're an angry person, and uh, because you've killed an animal, you have a tendency to become a serial killer. <laughs> at least that's what they told me, and at the time, I hadn't taken philosophy or logic, so I believed them. <laughs> but, uh, but what am I gonna talk about today? Um, the message I have today is, a, is one that I don't, honestly, I, don't ex I didn't expect myself to share it. I like the idea of telling you guys about, you know, some of the mission trips I've gone on and some of the exciting things that have happened. I like the idea of telling you about some of the, the highs in my life, the times when I've encountered the Holy Spirit and it was just, it was awesome. You know, the times when I've encountered the Lord and you're living on, on cloud nine and everything's happy-go-lucky, but the reality is, is between the mountains of spirituality, there's a lot of crap. You're either fighting to go uphill or rolling downhill. And right now, I'm rolling downhill because graduation's there. And I think I'm lying like this and just kind of falling down. So pardon me if I seem a little bit distracted. I'm in, I'm in the process of spinning and rolling down. Um, I've been speaking to my mom lately. And the reason I've been speaking to her is because I'm living with my family uh, because they're home on furlough. I grew up on the mission field and there are some times when I was a good Christian kid and then the majority of the rest of the times I wasn't. I was the rebellious son who was either getting suspended from school or almost getting expelled. At least that was in high school. And when I came to Biola, I was excited about this fresh start. And as I said just a little bit earlier, I was going to go on a mission trip. It fell through and I was frustrated and it was going to go into the spring semester of my freshman year. And I decided, you know, what if I just went back to Africa? That would be great just to get away from America. You know, I think I'm black anyways. And I grew up there. I mean, there, no, seriously, there was a while where I, I was convinced I was Kenyan. But I uh, went through some identity crises there. So I was in chapel, and S, it was an SMU chapel, and they were making an announcement about needing trip leaders to go on mission trips. And Malawi was one of them. And they needed a guy. I said, great, they need a guy to lead a trip to Africa. Malawi is just south of Tanzania. Maybe after my trip, I could hike up or backpack up into Tanzania and, and live it up and go and see mom and dad and travel around and everything would be great. So I applied and you know, said some spiritual things, sounded like I knew what I was talking about, and they accepted me. So I, I conned them into having me lead a mission trip as a freshman to a country I'd never been to before um, with the motives that are completely wrong in terms of why you should even go on a mission trip. I mean, seriously, I was setting myself up to be a vacationary, not really a missionary. Um, so I ended up going, and once we got to the, to the, um, to the airport, I realized things were a little bit different. They weren't going to be as I'd expected. It wasn't just going to be this simple little mission trip uh, where we go out to some villages and show a Jesus film. Uh, right off the bat, I knew there was a problem because the guy, the, the, the local pastor picking me up, called me pastor. And then I knew I was in for a ride because here they were thinking I was this spiritual giant. And I'm just there because I wanted to get away from Los Angeles. So... I start leading the trip, you know, we're, we're going around. Um, that evening, the pastor tells me, he says, uh, yeah, Luke, we just want you to know that we're gonna have a revival. I said, really, that's great. Revival, that's awesome. He said, yeah, and it's gonna happen in the slums. I said, oh, I've been to some slums before. Those are some pretty shady spots. He says, yeah, and you're gonna preach. And I said, wow, I've never really preached before. So. So I'm freaking out, and, and, 
And the whole night I'm thinking, what do I do? The next day, uh, because Tom Sawyer is one of my most favorite uh, characters of all time, I convinced everyone else on the team that they should preach. So they ended up preaching, and it was, it was a time to prepare them for, for the other times when they would have to evangelize out in the villages. So I stepped back, and I was just clapping them, cheering them on. Uh, and then we went back a second day, and this time we were out of team members. So I was forced to preach. And I was like, oh, Lord, what do I even say? What do I even do? Um, he ended up, you know, helping me out, and... Honestly, I, I fell in love with preaching. Uh, this isn't a preach, this is a reflection. I saw, it's a senior reflection coming through the, through the gate today. I saw a senior reflection, so I thought, huh, I don't have to preach. That's, that takes the pressure off of it. But that time, I, I really fell in love with preaching, and through the rest of the trip, just poured my heart and soul into, into the messages that I was going to give. And, and we were coming back. We were coming back from the villages, and... Um, we, had, we bought local cell phones to communicate with people, and it, you don't get network out in the villages, but sometimes you do, and that's crazy because you're out in the middle of nowhere, and you have a cell phone. And then if you need to charge it, you just go to the little guy down in his hut, and he has a um, solar panel rigged up to a battery, and he can charge your phone for you. That's cool. So my phone was working. It had enough battery on it, and we got back to the conference center, and I turn on my phone, and I get a text message. Now, mind you, I'm, I'm in charge, so I have to organize all of, you know, the rooms. Where's everyone going to stay? What money goes where? What's happening for dinner? It's amazing what happens to Americans when they go to another country, and uh, it, it's almost like they break down. They don't know what to do. It's, they just fall. Like, the bones just are gone. They just fall to the ground, and I'm <laughs> trying to help them get them back up. So... So I look at my phone, though, and, and I get a message that I wasn't expecting. And it says, because at that time, too, I was missing my high school reunion. And I was a little bit bitter about that because I thought I could use this mission trip as a chance to go back and go to my senior you know, high school reunion three years after. Um, and I look at my phone, and I, and I become okay with that, too. You know, I said, all right, Lord, you know what, I'll just, I'll, I'll let you win that battle. I'll win the next one. Um, and I looked at my phone and it was from my mom uh, because I'd given her my phone number because moms like to know your phone number and she was in Tanzania at the time she says Luke I'm so sorry but I just got word that your friend Ben Entwistle passed away and that wasn't what I had expected And thinking about it, you know, I, I didn't know what to think. I, I looked at the text message and I said, Ben Entwistle passed away. Ben was the guy who um, we played rugby together. We'd known each other growing up. Um, living in boarding school, I had about 40 brothers. So not to belittle the relationship that I had with Ben, but to just say that I have a lot of friends who I'm close with. Uh, to whom I would consider brothers, Ben being one of them. And at my graduation from high school, I was asked to speak, and I called Ben. Uh, he was the only person from my class that I mentioned by name, telling him thank you for his life, because Ben was a guy who'd had a heart transplant, and he had this huge scar down the middle, and doctors advised him not to, not to exercise or do anything like that. And his parents, his dad was a doctor, and they, they said, you know what? They were, they were that joyful missionary family that everyone admired. Um, and Ben was the kid who just always had some sort of amazingly positive outlook on life. Sometimes it was annoying. Um, but I called him and I said, Ben, thank you for, for living your life and not letting your heart condition limit what you do. Um, you've been an inspiration to me. So this is the guy who I hear has passed away, and I don't know what to do. And right at that time, someone comes up and asks me what to do, or they hit my arm, and the phone drops. And the guy makes a joke, hey, hold on to your phone, buddy. And, and I remember not enjoying that comment. <laughs> I went down, I went down to, I went 
to the, once I got everyone sorted out, I went down to the end to kind of process, down to the end of the compound, uh, gave my mom a call, and what she said was, she, she just said, Luke, I'm so sorry. And that's when I started to cry. And we had a good conversation. I thought about leaving the mission trip and, and coming up if there's any memorial service or funeral that was going to be there. Um, some of the team members that I was with tried to give me advice. And let me just let you know, if, you, if it, any of you are going through some sort of loss or you meet someone who is going through loss or pain or challenges, the worst thing to do is to give them advice. And, even, and beyond that is to tell them, well, I knew someone who died and this is... And, and I thought it was okay because, you know, there was Jesus. That's really not encouraging for someone who's, who's pissed at God. So um, I thought about leaving through, through a series of, of conversations and times with the Lord. I decided I was going to stay, but I decided that I wasn't going to preach anymore. And Kyle Lundquist was on the trip at the time. We went out to a village, and, and I, I had three days left. It was, we had three days of our last trip. And Kyle says to me, he says, Luke, I know you said you're not going to preach, um, but I think you should, you should at least do a, a Sunday school with the kids. I'm like, whatever, Kyle. Do a Sunday school. And he said, and I think you should do it on the book of Jonah. And that, for me, was, was a, out of all the books he could have picked, Jonah would have been, Jonah's the only one that actually has some sort of weight uh, with me. It's the one that I really, I've connected with God so many times in it um, previously to that point. So I, I kind of told Kyle, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I'll, I'll read and I'll think about it. So I started reading through the book of Jonah and it's four chapters. Read through chapter one. I was like, okay. Read through chapter two and I was, I was really empathizing with Jonah of hating people and life and everybody and, and God too. Um, got through chapter three and was loving his message of turn or burn, but sucks for you, you're going to burn anyways. Um, and then I got to chapter four, and it, it talks about how God, Jonah was mad because the plans didn't work out the way he wanted to. And, and as I was reading through, the Lord spoke to me through the, past, through the verses that I didn't expect. The verses that stood out to me was, when Jonah had the plant that was over him, he said God provided the plant. And verse 7 said, but God also prepared a worm and sent the worm and killed it at the night. And at that moment, I thought about Ben because Ben's story was, was one where his dad was with him on the flight down to South Africa. And they had everything medically that they needed for him to survive. Yet 30 minutes before landing, he passed away. And his dad reading his blog, his blog only talked about how great God was and it was, it was God who, who, um, who allowed this to happen or whatever, you know, and I was getting mad about the, I, I was just pissed, I, I didn't re like reading the blog. Um, but reading this verse, it said God sent a worm and, and, and the plant died. That hit me and... And then reading a little bit farther, God asked Jonah, he says, is it right for you to be angry because the plant died? And Jonah says, yes. Even angry enough to die. And I was like, right on, Jonah. Right on. He says, then the Lord said, you feel sorry about the plant, but you did nothing to put it there. And the plant is only at best short-lived. And say what you want about the word of God and say what I mean, this is not exegeting it in any way, but this is the one verse that I could think about through my Biola experience that struck me to the core, that actually changed me deep. And when I read that, I realized, okay, God, you win. You win. Um, I know that you have a plan for this, and I'm going to, and I'm going to trust you with it. And the reason I'm telling you this story is because I had hoped that you would have a little bit of a different perspective when it comes to trials and difficulty and that you would desire to experience God in the midst of it. And I hope that you would also hear this story and hear me when I say that I'm still desiring to, to go into missions. I'm still desiring to go to where people aren't. 
it's not a comfortable thing to think about. Um, I don't like the idea of going to the 1040 window. I'd rather go to Africa. Um, but my mom has been speaking to me, and the Lord has been speaking to me, and, and, and just being around other people who inspire me, I've concluded that, you know, when my mom was at Biola, and my dad too, sorry, I just keep saying mom. Yesterday was Mother's Day. Um, my dad too, when they were at Biola, the thing that everybody talked about was the 1040 window and Muslims and unreached people groups. And since I've been at Biola, all they've been talking about is the 1040 window and Muslims and unreached people groups. And the thing for me is I'm going to go unless God tells me to stop. And I'm going with the reality that I know there's going to be hurt along the way. I know there's going to be challenges and I know it's not going to be easy. And the reason I'm not telling you the good stories that I've had is because I think that does you a disservice to the reality of what Biola's like and what life is like and what the kingdom of God is like. Because we live in darkness and we have the light. And if you don't have the light, you should get it. You can only be holy if you encounter the holy God. You can only live for him if you meet the living God. You can only disciple people in the ways of Jesus if you yourself are discipled by him. And I'm trying to do the same and daily. Well, some days I get it right. So thank you and cherish this Bible experience. It's been great for me and I hope it'd be great for you. We hope you enjoyed this message. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Learn more at biola.edu.